for those of you, the last three of you on the planet who have not heard about what I'm talking about in the yoga world um, is this article that appeared in the New York Times last week, How Yoga Can Wreck Your Body, with uh, funny photographs of people clowning around in yoga postures, which was actually a major article in the uh, Sunday Times uh, supplement magazine, the magazine supplement for Sunday Times, New York Times. It was written by um, a senior science writer, uh, an award-winning senior science writer, um, about how yoga can wreck your body. Let me state right at the outset that I think this is a great conversation to be having. Uh, it's a conversation that, uh, for obvious reasons, we've been having around here for a very long time. It is not a new conversation for us. Um, I will also say that as a bit of marketing for a book that's about to be released, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Because on the strength of that article, it shot to the top of the yoga category on Amazon. Not that I obsessively checked that category or anything, but I just happened to notice as I was perusing the web trying to see where yoga anatomy was that it shot to the top on pre-orders. So their mission was accomplished, and they knew exactly what they were doing. I have no doubt whatsoever. By putting that part of the conversation forward in the article prior to the book's release. If it was about the benefits of yoga, it would have been, <gasps> oh, yeah, right, sure. We hear about that all the time. So it got the attention intended to. It started a conversation which I think is valuable, a conversation which for some people is just starting, and for us has been going on for a while. That having been said, let me say the article itself, and this is just the article, not the book, mind you, which I'm sure goes into the benefits, contains several um, glaring inaccuracies and misconceptions. The normal range of motion of axial rotation of the cervical spine is not 50 degrees. This is 50 degrees. You can try it on your own neck. And we're going to explore this in class later on in this trimester. What are considered to be the normal ranges of motion of the spine, cervical, thoracic, lumbar in axial rotation, lateral flexion, lumbar, uh, sorry, uh, flexion and extension. We will explore those. And there's numbers that are considered to be normal. 50 degrees is nowhere near normal range of motion. It's more like 80 to 90, right? That's an error. It's an error. At another point in the article, he says flexion when he meant extension. That should have been caught. It's, a, it's an obvious glaring error. And this is an award-winning science writer. Uh, this, these things were pointed out very well by Marshall Haggins, who uh, commented on a post on my friend Eddie Stern's uh, blog, for, uh, on his uh, Ashtanga Yoga New York blog. We're going to post a link to that article on this week's lesson page. Uh, and it's a great title, because the title of Eddie's blog post is How the New York Times Can Wreck Yoga. And there's a comment there by, um, by uh, Marshall Haggins, wh whom I happen to know, who's been in here, actually, in this room with us. Um, and uh, another uh, comment by a chiropractor who also dispels some of the myths around this tearing of the cervical arteries, okay, which is sort of the main really, really scary thing that uh, was in the article. Okay. Now, the misconception, these are, those are factual inaccuracies. The misconception is this. Let's just say that there's been a, a worldwide craze for the last couple of decades for people drinking goju berry juice for their health. I don't even know if there was such a thing. Is there such a thing as goju berry? I'm saying goju, so whatever. I'm just making it up. I just pulled it out of my ass. Goju berry juice. And there's been nothing but praise for this. And you know, and apart from the occasional people drinking way too much of it, OK, and getting sick from drinking too much of it, you know, it's been an unqualified good in the world. Now, the New York Times science writers come out with an article saying, goju berry juice has been found in some cases to cause death and paralysis, <laughs> citing the case studies, right? That would be scary as hell for the goju, goju juice <laughs> drinking population. I had to pick a tongue twister, right? 
the goji juice drinking population. That would be scary as hell. Now that's the equivalent of what's going on right now in the yoga world. We've had people here, right at the Breathing Project, in one of our classes, you know, one of our yoga for mental wellness classes, where people come in because they have anxiety disorders, afraid to participate in class. And we're not doing shoulder stand or plow or anything like that. But it's like yoga can paralyze you. That's the broad generalization. Okay? And, and there's people who are really benefiting from this who are now scared, which I think is very unfortunate. The, let's just say that instead of yoga, he used the proper term asana practice. Let's just grant him that. Because to equate yoga with asana practice is a very deep and false you know, um, uh, uh, connection there, you know. It's a conflation. So let's just say he meant, really meant asana practice. It would be like, you know, you'd have to turn asana practice into something it isn't in order to talk about it that way. It is not goju berry juice. It's not a drug. It's not any kind of agent that has its own distinct or separate properties apart from the person using it. That is true of a juice or a chemical of any kind. You can analyze its properties and you can say it has this particular effect on most people, but these people here, because of X, Y, and Z, it's going to have this effect, which is dangerous. You can say that, and we do that all the time with foodstuffs and chemicals and drugs and so on. Yoga is not a drug. Okay? It's not even, a th asanas are not things. There's no such thing as an asana. Okay? In order for downward dog to show up in the universe, an individual breathing human being with a history and a body and a genetic inheritance and all of that is going to have to put their body into a shape. Then we can say, oh, look, there's downward dog. Well, what we're really saying is Leah doing downward dog. You cannot pull the down dog out of that and say, look, here it is, and it has these properties. So what's, what this article did was it did something like that to things like shoulder stand and plow and headstand. And it said, shoulder stand, plow, and headstand are dangerous. It didn't say, when certain people do it, who have certain things going on in their body, in a certain way, it can be dangerous. That's a big fat duh. I mean, who didn't know that, right? And the other thing it didn't, get, didn't do, the article, which is pointed out in these comments to Eddie's thing that I'll post, is it did not place yoga on the spectrum of risky behavior. There is an assumption of risk that every single human being takes when they leave their house in the morning. There's an assumption of risk you take by getting out of bed and staying in your house all day. It's on, admittedly on the lower end of the risk spectrum in terms of the activities you're going to do. On the other end of the risk spectrum are things like riding a rice burner without a helmet. You know, one of those motorcycles that you see zooming along the West Side Highway, right? Or skydiving or shark fishing, you know, in a wetsuit. You know, there's really risky behavior that humans participate in. Somewhere between those two extremes are things like football, soccer, working out at the gym, okay, having a class with a personal trainer. Any kind of sport or fitness activity you could possibly name is going to be somewhere in that spectrum of risk. What, and I, I, I hope the book does this. They certainly didn't do it in the article. And again, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about the book. I haven't seen the book. Where on that risk spectrum would you put yoga? If it's a scientific exploration of the risk and benefits of yoga, which it says right on the cover of the book, that has to be part of the conversation. Where on that spectrum would you put yoga? And that's what I'm still waiting to see. And that, uh, I think, is a good thing to be talking about. And I'm glad that the dialogue is happening. It's just unfortunate that such an esteemed science writer has made such uh, glaring factual uh, errors in the article and bought into a really deeply rooted misconception that's held not just by him, but by many yoga teachers and even some of the ancient texts. They'll say, oh, this asana banishes that problem. It's right there in the Sanskrit. You know, you do this asana for half an hour and that problem goes away or whatever. I mean, that's a, that's a mentality that we're trying to address by showing people what's really going on. So I just wanted to say that. I wanted to get that on camera. OK, this will probably be one of those little YouTube video segments that gets out there, which is fine. And this is my way of responding to it, because I'm too lazy to write a response. It's easier when it just pours out of my mouth, because I'm a really crappy, slow, dyslexic typist. So thank you very much. I will see you next week.
and uh, have fun not getting injured in yoga. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs>